of the least controversial connotation in today's society. And while there are legitimate concerns associated with GMOs in the areas of social, cultural, and economic areas, today I'd like to simply talk about the biological safety of GMOs. Are they safe to use? And we found that they were. In a study that came out in 2013, a meta-analysis that reviewed over 1,750 pieces of scientific literature in the area of GMO usage, the researchers found no significant, no significant risk associated with the usage of GMOs. However, pieces of scientific literature are still coming out that say otherwise, such as a paper in 2012 that uh, stated, or claimed rather, that a GMO strain of corn causes brain tumor formation in rats. Not exactly a good thing with GMOs. However, this article and a lot of other pieces of literature like it have since been debunked, usually due to lack of proper controls or even the falsification or fabrication of data. And as easy as it may be to become stagnated on negative images like this, as biological researchers trying to do some good in the world, we're more interested in images like this. Just the last thousand or so years, our population is growing at an overly exponential rate. It's ridiculous. Since 1960, our population has doubled. And if this trend continues by 2050, our population as a globe will exceed 11 billion people. 11 billion people is a lot of mouths to feed. This is creating something known as a global hunger epidemic, and we need to find a way to effectively and efficiently feed these people in the right way. One of the ways we want to do this is through the usage of GMOs, specifically transgenic crops. Usually when people think of GMOs, they think of taking a gene from one organism and hybridizing it into the genome of another organism. That's actually a transgenic technology, and that's known as a transgenic crop. A genetically modified organism is any organism that has been modified in any way genetically. So for thousands of years, farmers have been using selective breeding. That's genetically modified. Those crops are technically genetically modified. Today, I'd like to talk about transgenic organisms, which is a type of GMO. A way that this has been used recently can be seen in Hawaii. One of Hawaii's biggest exports is, in fact, papayas. The papaya industry is booming in Hawaii. And in the early 90s, around 1992, a virus called the ring spot virus emerged in the environment. It wiped out the papayas, and the entire industry was gone. It was actually almost completely desolated, and it was not a good time for the papaya farmers in Hawaii. But a couple years later, researchers came out with a transgenic crop, a transgenic strain of papayas that was biotically resistant to this ring spot virus. That strain was reintroduced into the environment, and a couple years later, just by 1998, the entire industry had rebooted, and everything was back to fine and dandy in Hawaii. So tourists can go back there and eat papayas. A couple of other really exciting areas of research where GMOs and transgenic crops are being used is this exciting list here, and I'd like to briefly go through it. So there's a tomato that has been infused with a cholera vaccine, and if you consume this, the fleshy skin of the tomato stays into your GI tract long enough to elicit an immune response. It's literally a tomato, and it's a vaccine. We talked about biotic resistance. There's also abiotic resistance, so resistance to non-pathogenic invaders, such as flood resistance or drought resistance or even salt resistance. Salt resistance is especially exciting because we use fresh water to water our plants. But if we can use ocean water, if we can tap that massive source of ocean water, water our plants without killing them with the salts, then we can use all that fresh water for other things like drinking. Last thing is some environmental benefits. For example, there is a GMO or transgenic strain of grass that has been engineered to be more easily digested by cows, leading to decreased levels of methane emission from the cows. So GMOs and transgenic crops can really come at it from all levels. So really, our rationale as a whole is to study the plant's immune system so that we may create more resilient crops in the future and do some global good by fighting the global hunger epidemic. And in our research, we're using a plant called Arabidopsis thaliana. You can see it on the cover of Science, the small green weed-like plant. And here's a common Arabidopsis lab. You can see them lined up. They're kind of wrapped in wax paper, which is common. But that's a typical Arabidopsis lab. And the two main reasons we use Arabidopsis is that A, it has a fully sequenced genome. So we, it's completely mapped. We can move our way around and maneuver it. We know where everything is, and it's a lot easier to study. Also, Arabidopsis has a relatively short lifespan, so we can do lots of experiments on it, lots of trials, and get relatively quick results. It's essentially the fruit fly of the plant world. While the fruit fly, or Drosophila, has been studied extensively in animal, in animal genetic studies, Arabidopsis is kind of the go-to plant for plant genetic studies for the past half century or so. So let's get to the immune system. 
In a typical immune system, some foreign invader comes in, activates some white blood cells, platelets, inflammation, what have you, and it elicits or produces some kind of an immune response. But what would happen if there were no such thing as white blood cells or platelets or inflammation as we know it? Well, it would seem that there wouldn't be an immune system produced and then a the multicellular organism would die. And dying isn't, isn't exactly a fun thing for a multicellular organism to undergo. And it just so happens that plant cells have no white blood cells. They have no circulating defender cells. They have no circulating any cells. Plant cells are immobile, and their circulatory system is primarily used for the movage, for the transport of water and nutrients. But they have to have an immune system, right? So they make up for this with something called innate immunity. It is immunity that is innate. The plant cells are born with this. Each cell is equipped with the cellular machinery to both detect and fight off any kind of pathogen. One of the ways they do this is through the detection of something called MAMPs. MAMP stands for Microbe Associated Molecular Pattern. By molecular pattern, we mean a protein, a protein that is in the environment of the plant cell because a pathogen is in the environment. There are specific receptors outside the cell wall of the plant that can actually detect these MAMPs and that elicits an immune response. Some common MAMPs that have been studied and used include Flagellin. So you have a common bacterium, it has a flagella tail used primarily for mobility. That flagella tail is made of proteins called flagellin. And there's a flagellin sensitive receptor on the plant cell, a specific MAMP receptor for flagellin. Another MAMP that's commonly used is something called chitin, which is found ubiquitously in the cell walls of fungal cells, which is again another pathogen commonly studied, commonly associated with plants. One more thing to get into before the research is something known as the central dogma of biology. This is something that is essential to just about all biological research, ours not excluded. And essentially it states that DNA is turned into RNA, which is turned into protein, by two processes known as transcription and translation. And that protein has some kind of a cellular function. Proteins are the workhorses of the cell. They are the reason we have DNA. They do just about everything for the cell. So this is such an important process, this protein-making process, this is highly regulated. Some, pre some proteins we want lots of at certain times, some we want little of at certain times. The way it's regulated is through the regulation of specific segments of DNA called genes. It's a short, specific segment of, G of DNA that is transcribed into RNA, which corresponds to a protein. So while DNA is always hanging out in the nucleus of a cell, typically RNA is only present when the cell needs that RNA as corresponding protein for some cellular function. So RNA can be, used as a, can be seen as a quantitative measure of cell protein expression. But what would happen if we knocked out transcription? If you knock out transcription, you knock out translation, you knock out the protein, and you don't get a cellular function. This is known as a knockout gene. When a gene is no longer able to express its protein effectively, it's known as a knockout gene. I'm going to refer to knockout genes for uh, the remainder of this presentation, but you should know where that term comes from. So our research began with something called a microarray analysis. It is literally a lab on a chip about this big. And what happens is you take two plants. One of them might be wild type, so no genes are knocked out. One of them, you knock out a gene, and you treat them, say, with MAMPs to trigger an immune response and you measure the levels of RNA, again, RNA being a quantitative measure of cell protein expression. This can tell us something about what's happening in the cell on the molecular level in response to MAMPs, or when an immune response is triggered, in different plants. And it looks something like that. And while we don't have to get into exactly what this means, essentially the intensity of the color corresponds to the regulation of the gene. And there's a lot of data. Each little dot corresponds to a single gene. But one of the really interesting things that we found from this microarray analysis is this. Then in wild type cells with nothing knocked out, you treat them with a MAMP, elicit an immune response, and you get normal, typical levels of this gene called FPGS3. But in plants where a gene called the immune activator, because it's a gene that activates the immune system, is knocked out, when you treat it with a MAMP and try to trigger the immune response, you have decreased levels of FPGS3 which shows us that levels of FPGS are suppressed by MAMPs in immune activator knockouts. Again, levels of FPGS are suppressed by MAMPs in immune activator knockouts. We think that this is because FPGS is somehow a component of the immune system. It's involved, it's important, it's essential. 
So what the heck does FPGS mean? What does it stand for and why is it important? FPG FPGS stands for folopolyglutamate synthetase. You got it? Good. Folo stands for folate. Polyglutamate refers to multiple glutamate residues, glutamate being an amino acid commonly incorporated into a protein. And synthetase referring to a specific kind of enzyme that uses cellular energy in its mechanism. So basically, FPGS takes a folate molecule, burns some ATP, and attaches a bunch of glutamate residues to it. Cool. This has been studied and is known to lead to nucleotide biosynthesis, the biosynthesis of nucleotides. And the biosynthesis of nucleotides is required for a lot of cellular processes, such as the production of DNA and RNA, energy, and even redox homeostasis for you, bio, for you biochemists out there. Something that's really cool is that the immune system is nowhere here. It has never been studied. FPGS in the immune system has never, ever, 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 ever been studied. This is a completely new and novel area of research that has never been touched, and that makes it really exciting. So the way that we have tried to determine if FPGS is a part of the immune system is through those two assays, known as the seedling growth, seedling growth inhibition assay and the callus deposition assay. We're really boring in biology. We're, we're literally measuring the inhibition of seedling growth and the deposition of callus. And those can be used as quantitative measures of the immune system, and here's why. When you treat a cell with a MAMP or you trigger the immune response, that cell has a finite amount of energy. So it's gonna funnel a bunch of its energy towards the immune system response, leaving less energy available for cell growth. So the less a cell grows, the more of an immune response there is. So there's an inverse relationship. Something else that happens in response to an immune system being triggered is the cell wants to make its cell wall as thick and rigid and as difficult for pathogens to break in and wreak havoc as possible. One of the ways they do this is through depositing a molecule known as callus in the cell wall, which makes it thicker. So the more callus that's deposited, the more of an immune system response there is. So that's more of a direct relationship. And here are the results we've, we've found while studying this at Beloit. We have found that knockouts of the gene FPGS2 are less sensitive to MAMPs. Real quick, let's look at this graph. We got four genotypes that we're testing. One of them is COLO, wild type, nothing wrong with it. And then three knockouts, lowercase indicates knockout gene. FPGS 1, 2, and 3. There are three copies of FPGS in Arabidopsis because it's so important. These copies are known as isoforms, and this is known as functional redundancy. There are multiple of these for a reason. It's so important that it made copies so that, say, if one of these was actually knocked out naturally, the other two could theoretically swoop in and make up for the fact that one of them is missing. They're all really similar, but they're kind of different a little bit, and we want to see if one of them is more important than the others. The black bars indicate untreated cells, plants, so there's lots of growth, y-axis referring to uh, the growth of the seedling. These gray bars indicate the corresponding plants that have been treated with MAMPs, so an immune, an immune response was triggered. And you can see the first, second, and fourth one are really similar levels, but that third one is a little higher. FPGS2 knockouts are less sensitive to MAMPs, and we found a p-value of 0.11 with that. And for you biometricians out there, while this is not yet statistically significant, this is only from three independent trials, and with each trial, the p-value has gone down and down and down. So we believe that if we do more trials and increase the power, we'll find a statistically significant result. Moving to the callus deposition assay, we find that the title does not change. FPGS2 knockouts are still less sensitive to MAMPs. We use the same four genotypes, the four lower bars referring to untreated plants. So there's no immune system, there's not a lot of callus. The y-axis referring to callus deposition. And again, the first and second and fourth bars are all pretty similar in their levels of callus deposition. But that third one is a lot lower. And we haven't done statistical analysis on this yet because we don't have a high enough n value to do it yet. But this is, something, this is another thing that we are pursuing. So our conclusions is that if you don't have FPGS2, you don't have an immune response based on a decreased level of seedling growth inhibition and less callus deposition. Why? Why is this? We can quantitatively measure it, but why is this? Why is FPGS2, or FPGS rather, so important in the immune system? We want to delve deeper on the molecular level and find out other important players. What other proteins are important and why? What exactly is FPGS2 doing? 
Also, talking about functional redundancy, all those copies of FPGS, we were dealing with single knockouts. But remember, functional redundancy can theoretically make up for that single knockout. So we're currently isolating and trying to use double knockouts of FPGS to find out a little more about what this gene, FPGS, can do or what it does in the immune system. Also, we talked a little bit about MAMP receptors, the specific receptors that detect MAMPs and elicit an immune response. There is genetic diversity in that. Just like any other multicellular organism, Arabidopsis thaliana exists in naturally occurring populations throughout the world, just like humans. They're known as ecotypes. And different ecotypes have, been, have slightly different genomes due to different evolutionarily different selection factors. And some of these ecotypes have actually, have actually evolutionarily selected for non-functional MAMP receptors. They have selected to not have a functional MAMP receptor. This is known, but we don't know exactly why this is. And while this doesn't exactly pertain to the FPGS studies, this does pertain to the plant immune system in the area of, of MAMPs, and this is a pretty important area. So bringing it back, we really just want to study the plant immune system, contribute to this growing body of research to create transgenic crops for global good, creating hardier and more resilient crops. With that, I'd like to thank Dr. Lawrence Pakula, a pediatrician on the East Coast who has continuously funded the Biomedical Scholars Program with which I began this research last summer. I'd like to thank Dr. Amy Briggs for being my mentor and my principal investigator throughout this entire process. And of course, I'd like to thank the Beloit College Department of Biology for their continued support throughout this entire endeavor. And with that, I'd be happy to take any questions. Thanks. Well, that sounds like a debate that you'd like to have, or a debate question, rather, rather than, rather than a presentation or a fact. And I'd be happy to talk to you after the presentation, after this entire uh, thing, about Monsanto or Dow or anything like that. But again, today, we're not talking about the socioculture or economic concerns. We're talking primarily the biological safety of it. And from what we found, GMO seeds or transgenic seeds are no different, are no more, are no more dangerous than, uh, I think she called them native seeds. I have not had direct experience working with them, but I do live near farms that do do that, and I have talked to the farmer. Um, so because if, if you did, uh, you would probably know that like, these fields are sprayed, uh, right? Mm -hmm. And so I, I do work um, on an organic farm here, and I, I have been affected by um, the sprays that they use. Okay. Um, well, I, think, I think Josh has uh, addressed your question. If he's talking about the science today, and we have many other people who would like to ask questions. Why? So he's, he's invited me to talk with him afterwards. So I think it would be reasonable to have others ask some questions. But thank you for contributing more. Yes, Rock? Uh, when you talked about those three knockouts, did those correspond to the three different isoforms? Yes, those are three different isoforms of FPGS. They're simply called FPGS1, FPGS2, and 3. So number two is clearly the important one. Are more important is what we're finding. Yeah, that's actually something we've been thinking about. We haven't explicitly uh, stated that that's a direction we want to take, but that's something that uh, Amy Briggs and I have discussed. Yeah. Any other questions? Any Gwen?
Uh, absolutely. Um, well, after Beloit, I'm not planning on going into research. Uh, from the remainder of my time at Beloit, I am planning on continuing this research, uh, specifically the genetic biodiversity of MAMP receptors. Uh, I'm planning on that being my thesis. Hopefully, it'll be published in, in the Beloit Biologist next year. That's what I'm planning on doing. In the, in the overall flow, of, in the overall scheme of things, this is essentially a preliminary study. We're trying to contribute to the massive growing body of knowledge of the plant immune system so that down the road, someone can use our research and another person's research and aggregate them all together to create, say, a transgenic crop to fight the ring spot virus. That's essentially what happened. It was science happening. It was a bunch of people contributing their research, and that's how the ring spot virus transgenic crop was able to be produced. Yeah? Oh. So Josh has time for another question or two that I'd like to invite the next speaker to come forward to uh, set up the computer in the process so that we can have a smooth transition to the next talk. Go ahead. Yeah. Um, with the possibility of mutations in like microorganisms, do you think it's possible that you know, they would develop mutations to counteract the previous type? Can you say it louder, please? With the possibility of like, mutations in microorganisms that affect the plant, do you mm -hmm. think it's possible that they would be you know, microorganisms to find a way to kind of avoid this to avoid FPA gene? Yeah, to basically grow behind, Absolutely. It's possible that plants can evolutionarily, evolutionarily select for that situation, but on the microevolution scale, which is still a pretty long time, I, that's actually an interesting question to see if that would happen, and if so, how long it would take for that to happen. But yeah, that is definitely a possibility for plants to go to the back door with FPGS2. All right. Uh, last question, yeah. We actually only found levels of FPGS3 were affected, and that's what led us to FPGS as a whole. So yeah. did, you, did FPGS2 show increased? Mm, no, it did not. Yeah. All right. Thanks.